All right. Very good. Well, today is our day of innovation. Yesterday was transformation. We're moving on to innovation. And boy, have we got innovators today. We got the innovator who invented nothing short of the microprocessor. We've got the man who's made new inroads into cosmology and the spoken word. And we've got a futurist with us whose dreams are becoming reality. It's an amazing day, and you're really going to be taken on a ride into the innovative future today. So, innovation. Let's start with an introduction to our first presenter today. He started off designing microprocessors at Fairchild and went on to Intel. In 1971, he designed the Intel 4004, the first microprocessor. Worked at Intel for several years, then set up his own biz uh, technology business, Zilog, where he designed and produced the Z80 microprocessor that 40 years later is still uh, on the market. So in many ways kind of invented uh, what became all of our computerized world. I was talking to him this morning at, at breakfast and he sa I said, so can, and he was trying to explain the, a bit the nature of reality, and I said, so can we say that our brains are like microprocessors? And he said, oh no, we're far beyond that. And I said, well, that's easy for you to say. I'm just trying to find the on button up here myself, but uh, you know, uh, I have a little trouble with that with my own computer here. So if I stumble around on some of this technology here, just bear with me, right? Uh, it's not my expertise. No, he's a, he's a fascinating man and uh, has done some amazing work. Uh, he won the Medal of Technology and Innovation in 2009, the highest award for achievement in technology in the United States was awarded that by President Obama. So I think it gives you a little bit of an indication of the depth and scope. So Federico Fagin and his wife Elvia have formed the Federico, Fagin, Federico and Elvia Fagin Foundation. And so I asked him, so what do you, what do, you do at your foundation? And they are doing the research to mathematically support this hard problem we talked about the first night, that maybe consciousness came first, maybe it is the primal nature of the universe. Uh, well, they're trying to give the mathematical support for the information that might uh, move towards can't say proving it because it's not really real. Federica is going to explain this stuff better <laughs> than I am. I told you I'd probably stumble around with it. Um, amazing stuff. Here's the man, the designer of the microprocessor, the man who's going to find this support for the information of consciousness and he told me today, we're way ahead of schedule. So he's hoping in a year, maybe two, I'll use my own words, I think he's going to knock your socks off with the information technology to really prove that. No, can't say proof. Support. The consciousness <laughs> came first. All right. On that note, please open your own microprocessors, turn up the volume, and a round of applause for Federico Fagi. Well, I'm trying to prove something that cannot be proven, but actually I'm trying to well. find the clicker that I cannot be found. <laughs> I found it. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. 
uh, it's a real pleasure to be here to share my views about the nature of consciousness within a broader framework of the nature of reality. So, most scientists believe that consciousness is entirely produced by the brain. In other words, it is an epiphenomenon of a physical information processing system. The, they say that they can prove that because consciousness exists only as long as the brain is functioning. However, uh, this is a circular proof based on the assumption that only matter exists. In fact, the most direct perception that we can have is the sense of I am. This is the subjective inner feeling of being a self that exists, unmediated by the physical senses. And it is through that feeling that this self knows about its own existence. Materialism leads us to believe that we are machines, but no machine has feelings. A machine is just a chain of blind action reactions. So, to go beyond the current view, we have to start by recognizing that feelings are the substance out of which all of our conscious experience is made. Now, by feelings, I don't mean uh, just inner feelings and so on. I mean all feelings, starting from the sensations that we have, that we receive from the external world through our physical senses, the emotions that we feel, those are feelings, the thoughts that we have, those are feelings passing our mind. We know a thought because we feel a thought. In fact, even the most, the deepest feeling of connection with the transcendent, the spiritual feeling of being part of a universe, that's also a feeling. So when I talk about feelings, I mean all those feelings, different classes of feelings. Now, there is no known principle in physics that can explain how electrical activity in the brain can produce feelings, what uh, philosophers call qualia. The fact that we experience both inner and outer realities is neither predicted nor predictable by physics, according to which only outer reality should exist. Given the impossibility of explaining how consciousness, which generally speaking is the capacity to feel, may emerge out of atoms and molecules, a new theory based on the postulate that consciousness is an irreducible property of reality is the only other alternative. So how can we proceed? Well, the conceptual framework of physics is based on concepts derived from the human experience of the outer world. Things like space, time, matter, force, and so on. If we assume the primacy of consciousness, we need to start with a completely new framework based on concepts arising out of the deepest human experience of the inner world. Concepts such as self, identity, consciousness, free will, perception, and so on. We then need a new mathematical theory of reality that contains the current theories of physics as limit cases of a much broader theory. And the new theory must explain how the outer world of space, time, energy, and matter emerges, not the emerges out of the inner world of consciousness. Exactly like physics should explain how the inner world emerges out of space, time, energy, and matter, but has no clue about it. The new theory must explain both the inner and the outer aspects of reality and should be founded on a monism based on an extra-physical, indivisible wholeness at the origin of everything that exists. A few fundamental cognitive principles, holism rather than reductionism, the use of mathematics based on non-classical logic. We already know that human concepts actually follow quantum logic, not Boolean logic. 
the use of, uh, and, and the experimental verification of this theory's prediction, which of course that's the hallmark of science. You have to verify experimentally, make prediction and verify those, ex those uh, uh, predictions experimentally. The fundamental concepts of physics should then be derived from the fundamental cognitive concepts of the new theory. I expect the new theory to bring a completely new perspective in the study of biology, neuroscience, medicine, cognitive science, psychology, and so on. All the soft sciences, they are essentially starting now through materialistic principles, and they are ill-informed by them. The new conceptual framework then starts with one, an indivisible wholeness out of which everything is made. The substance of one is extra-physical, dynamic, an aware energy, energy with capital E, with unlimited creative potential. So, essentially, this is not very different from what physics says. The, the energy of the Big Bang, the energy that created space, time, and matter, I'm simply saying, hey, this energy that has the seeds for space, time, and matter also contains the seeds of consciousness from the outset. These seeds are, in, 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 uh, are part, fundamental part of this energy. So now, I don't know where I am. <laughs> I know that I am here, but I don't know where I am there. <laughs> So one has the capacity and the urge to perceive, to know, and to fulfill itself. And it does so by means of feelings. Feelings is how you know, how you perceive. So feelings are an essential ingredient. And of course, feelings is exactly what physics cannot explain, how they can arise out of matter. Each self-perception of one, then, creates a new and unique consciousness unit. The CU is a quantum of cognitive energy that is permanently shaped by that perception. In other words, one is a totality, is a wholeness. Wholeness cannot have parts. So it can only have part holes. When one perceives itself, that perception is energy shaped by that perception. That I call a consciousness unit. That's the atom out of which everything is made. It's an infinite atom. Each CU is an irreducible part whole of one with its own unique cognitive frame of reference through which it can perceive energy and know itself. Through the CUs, one then can perceive and know itself. Each CU has free will and a unique identity. Identity means that it is aware of itself within itself, just like you are aware of existing. That awareness is carried by the feeling, I am. Knowing requires a knower, a self, with the capacity to perceive the inner structure inherent in a perception. Therefore, knowing is like a self-perception inside a self-perception. Therefore, knowing is far more than perceiving. And to know itself means to be able to connect the dots. When the dots get finally are connected, there is a, aha, I got it. I now know. I now comprehend. I understand. So knowing is the foundation of the drive to, as we will see, the drive toward ever more complex forms. The CU's capacity to know itself means that the CU can unfurl the truth about itself, just like a flower unfurls itself. This truth is a dynamic and subjective truth, far from the concept of static and objective truth that we generally have. A CU can also be seen as a face, as an aspect of one, a self-consistent, dynamic, and independent cognitive unit, in short, a self. The CUs exist in superposition, just like quantum physics talks about superposition, in an extra-physical, semantic space 
call cognitive space, C space, where time doesn't exist. Now, the CUs then can view all this energy instantly. There is no time. The entire thing is viewed by each CU completely. Therefore, they can perceive everything that exists, but only as an observer. They cannot communicate with each other, but they see every, everybody through their unique filter of their own identity. So in order to communicate, they need to create some token, like we use words. They need to have something to point with. So out of their own substance, which is this uh, aware dynamic energy, the CUs shape some dynamic forms to be used as communication tokens. These tokens are called energy units, EUs. EUs are dynamic structures of energy serving as symbols that stand for the CU's feelings, exactly like a word stands for a feeling. EUs allow CU to communicate with each other and also to enter into deep relationships where each CU can fully comprehend its own feelings and the feelings of the partner, finding commonalities and differences. Now, complete comprehension of two CUs in a relationship give rise to a new independent self of a higher order, in this case, second order. The CUs are the first order selves, which then continues its own self-knowing independently without subsuming the CUs that formed it. Then two second order selves can similarly combine to create a third order self, and this process continues ad infinitum. With the EUs, the CUs co-evolve a hierarchy of cells and a hierarchy of communication languages, which is tokens plus the syntactical rules that connect those tokens, in step with the evolution of their own self-knowing. So we have two parallel, so to speak, hierarchy that emerge out of this communication driven by the desire of one to know itself through selves. The syntactical space of tokens is called information space, or I space. I space is a public space with no time. Once a sufficient number of hierarchical levels of selves and tokens have developed, the communication tokens can also be used as structural elements to build many different physical universes, different space, times, and matters. Each universe is constructed by the cooperation of many orders of selves to have their own learning experience. Action is the result of the urge of one to know and fulfill itself, leading to the manifestation of material forms in which to express itself. To the tokens, the EUs, are the first such materialization. The material forms act like mirrors reflecting the structure of the self-knowing to the self. That's how the self knows, by reflecting itself upon its constructions, over its constructions. Any material manifestation, however, will fall short of fully expressing the self, leading the self to seeking expression in ever more complex new material forms. This is at the basis of any type of evolution. Action is then the never satisfied excess of inner potentiality trying to express itself in outer form. It is the inner source of never ending evolution and transformation of all selves and thus of one. Notice that one is far from omni omniscient. M most religions assume a one that knows everything. Well, if he knew everything, why would, why would we be here? Why would we have all these conflicts that we need to resolve and so on? One actually is far from omniscient, and it becomes ever more scient <laughs> as it learns through the experience of each and one of us. Therefore, it is impossible to fully know the self by studying only its outer forms. The outer forms can be studied by mathematics, but the inner forms, the feelings, are beyond mathematics. Within this conceptual framework, the fundamental cognitive unit then is the self. 
The self has five fundamental, irreducible, and interdependent aspects. They are like five facets of a whole, identity, free will, perception, comprehension, and action. Consciousness is the capacity of a self to perceive, know, and experience itself through feelings. Self and consciousness are inseparable because when we say consciousness, we imply a self and vice versa. However, self is more than consciousness since identity, free will, and action have characteristics that go beyond the concept of consciousness that I've just defined. So the ultimate reality is the semantic reality of the selves in C-space. I-space, the syntactic space, exists inside C-space in superposition with it, and all inner and outer realities emerge by the interactions between selves in C-space and I-space, their communication. The fundamental purpose of each self is to know and fulfill itself by interacting with other selves via hierarchies of tokens. Any given physical universe is created by the cooperation of many hierarchical levels of selves with the common purpose of having powerful cognitive experiences that advance their, their own self-knowing, eventually producing higher order selves for the same purpose, to advance the self-knowing of one. Two or more selves materialize a portion of themselves in a physical world to interact with other materialized selves and experience the material consequences of certain cognitive dissonance within them. We are materialized selves. The materialized self, generally known as ego, though it's, it's a broad definition, is a provisional consciousness made of a small portion of the combined consciousness of the selves intersecting the areas that need, that need full comprehension. When the materialized self identifies with the physical body, it will focus its consciousness primarily on the information coming from the sensory brain system of the body, creating a perception of I-space reality in C-space, because the self exists in C-space, that feels like a physical world. And this physical world that feels like, the, the way we perceive it, I call P-space. The selves witness the consequences of their not yet fully understood aspects through the physical manifestations of their provisional self. Many life cycles are needed to achieve the full comprehension that gives rise to a new higher order self. The physical universe then acts like a virtual reality world with the purpose of providing the necessary feedback to the selves to increase their own self-knowing and self-fulfillment and to also give birth to a new higher order self. Space, time, matter, and objects are thus illusions, manufactured by the sensory brain system of the body as it processes a particular set of I space symbols into the symbols that the ego perceives as the real world. Note that the information processed by the body comes exclusively from a small subset of the set of I-space tokens that constitutes a particular physical universe. Each materialized self thus creates a unique world, a P-space, correlated with the unique P-spaces of other similar selves through the cooperation of many layers of lower level selves. And it is this correlation that gives us the impression of existing in an objective world. It is not. It is an illusion. P-space is thus a projection of a small subset of I-space token into the consciousness existing in C-space of the materialized self given the appearance of a real world. The objective, so-called objective physical world and the, the objective physical laws, in fact, derive from the hierarchical syntactical laws of the I-space tokens. The cooperating selves, in order to communicate, they need to have rules. Otherwise, if, if, if they use 
you know, words in, in, indiscriminately, nobody can understand. So those fundamental rules of language, which are agreements, are the basis for the physical laws that we observe when we look at the world within from ice space. So the summary, in summary, the ultimate reality is not physical reality, but the extra physical semantic reality of selves existing in C space, in cognitive space. The fundamental cognitive principle driving manifestation is the urge of one to know and fulfill itself. The need of the selves to communicate produces I space. I space exists within C space and is the syntactic space containing the, symbol, the, the symbols used by the selves to communicate. All universes, all P spaces, emerge by the interactions occurring between C space and I space. And physical reality emerges in the consciousness of a particular materialized self when the self identifies with the material body in a, pro, in, in a projection of I space into C space for each self. The universe that I see is not the same that any one of you sees. We actually live in a virtual reality. Now, how do we prove this? Well, how do we, this so far is a story, you know, is a conceptual framework. Uh, it, you know, it is reasonably self-consistent, but the only way that you, we can actually create a theory that makes sense is to translate this conceptual structure into mathematics. Mathematics, of course, will only be able to describe I space, but I space being, uh, being a, ref a reflection of C space will go a long way to give us a good idea of what occurs within C space. So first we need a new logic, I call it cognitive logic, based on an extension and formalization of the logic of quantum information. It is a non-Boolean logic. In fact, it contains Boolean logic and quantum logic as limit cases. The cognitive logic then suggests new mathematical objects to be used in formulating a broader theory of I space that contains quantum physics and general relativity as limit cases. The new theory then must unify quantum physics and general relativity, make testable predictions not made by other quantum physics or general relativity, and provide much better explanations and resolve many existing paradoxes and conflicts and finally, unify inner and outer realities into a comprehensive theory. So the views that, are, that I'm expressing here are the result of a personal journey that started more than 25 years ago. Uh, say 30 years ago, I was just like any other physicist, believing that all that exists is matter and energy and space and time. And, uh, I thought that when I die, I would simply disappear, and that's the end of it. Um, and then, but I was also working with neural networks, and I wanted to create a conscious computer. So I started thinking about how can I make a conscious computer? The more I thought, the more impossible the task appeared to be. And, uh, and, and so I was really asking, well, what's going on here? And one day, I had a an unbelievable experience. Somehow, the, you know, the, <laughs> the universe responded to my desire to know, and I had an experience where fundamentally I saw no difference between my experience and myself. It was an extraordinary experience of consciousness. Uh, I saw the, essentially, like the energy of love that out of which everything is made uh, appear as a white light, and I was that energy, but I also was the observer of that energy, and that created a completely different viewpoint for me. And that was the beginning, that was one of many experiences that I had uh, later on, but that opened me up to consider alternatives that I would have said are totally foolish. <laughs> So, as you see, the experience is at the basis of everything. Intellect is far from experience. Intellect is I space talking, talking to each other. 
experience exists in sea space. It is a completely different ontology. There is ample evidence that science will not be able to explain the nature of consciousness based on materialistic principles, despite many promises to the contrary. They have promised that for 400 years. But so far, there is absolutely no, no clue, not even the smallest clue, that it is possible to explain how consciousness may emerge out of matter. We need, therefore, to vigorously pursue the development of a mathematical theory of reality, because that's the only way that you can convince the scientific community. This starts with the primacy of self and consciousness and is driven by cognitive principles, not by materialistic principles. And because if you want to do this research, there is no money for it. Then I started the Federico and Alvia Fagin Foundation in order to support and uh, not only support and to the extent that I can guide that uh, that search uh, uh, with, uh, with some financial resources. And I did that because I believe that there isn't anything more important to understand than what gives meaning to all existence. Thank you very much.